this is a debt that needs to be resolved as quickly as possible. I can think of many other ways to spend two million bucks a week than on setting it on fire. And so that's why um, you know I'm encouraging and using my speaking pulpit right as controller to shine some light on this and say, come on, everybody who has an actual direct role in fixing this, you get, need to get to work and fix it. Hello, welcome to the Cloudcast. I'm Alex Nitkin. I'll be your host this week. Illinois has spent a long time building at a reputation as one of the most financially troubled states in the nation, and it's pretty well deserved. Sky high pension debt, shoddy credit ratings. It doesn't sound like a great environment for one of the state's top financial leaders to be running for re-election. But Illinois controller Susana Mendoza is here to argue that things have gotten better since she rode into office five years ago. Mendoza used to be the city clerk of Chicago until 2016 when she unseated the incumbent Illinois controller Republican Leslie Munger in a special election. Mendoza sat down with me last week for a long and freewheeling conversation where she talked up some of her accomplishments, like reducing the size of the state's unpaid bill backlog and paying back a big Federal Reserve loan early. And she sets her sights on some of the big fiscal issues that are still haunting the state, like an even bigger loan repayment that is still owed to the federal government and the state's rainy day fund, whose current state she called woefully pathetic. She also talked about how she wants to make the controller's office a more central player in legislative policymaking and why we should not expect her to run for mayor of Chicago again. So here is my interview with Illinois controller Susana Mendoza. First and most important question, is it controller or comptroller? Because I know we have <laughs> all heard both pronunciations. Oh, that's so funny. So it just depends who you ask. But but logistically, or I should say linguistically speaking, right, the correct term is controller, even though it's spelled with a C-O-M-P-T, right? Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like potato, potato, tomato, tomato, whatever. I don't really care. I've certainly been called worse. So um, whether it's controller or comptroller, just kind of feels whatever mood you're in, you know? All right. Let's stick with controller for the purposes of today. So I imagine Sounds that good. when you are out, you know, on the campaign trail or talking to constituents and say, Hi, I'm, I'm Susana Mendoza. I'm your controller. I imagine you get a lot of, what the heck is a controller? Um, I asked a similar yeah. question of assessor Fritz Kagey when he was on the podcast, but basically like, what is your simple like bite-sized explanation that you give people like at the state fair or in those kinds of moments? Sure. And I get that question all the time, as a matter of fact. But um, I tell people that the, the controller is the state's chief fiscal officer. I think when you tell people that you're the CFO for the state, they, they understand that terminology because everyone knows kind of what a CFO does. And my job is to manage the state's finances and to pay the state's bills. So those are the, the two easy ways, I think, of, of defining what that role is. So on the topic of bill payment, you were able to kick off this year with a little bit of good news for everyone, which is that Illinois was able to pay off a $2 billion loan early from the Federal Reserve's Municipal Liquidity Facility. This mm -hmm. was sort of a federal loan program launched to help state and local governments through the pandemic. Um, you know, I remember the state relied on this money to balance its budget last year, and that drew some criticism from Republicans who said that the state was relying on this kind of like shaky, uncertain loan for its structural finances. So how, how big a deal is it that that loan is now fully paid off and ahead of schedule? Well, it's a huge deal. It's obviously tremendously good news for Illinois. I mean, when was the last time that you heard that the state paid back its debts, you know, two years early? So I have made it a, a real, um, you know, priority, frankly, to talk about being the need to be fiscally disciplined, to be fiscally responsible, to pay our debts, and not just pay them, but to pay them on time. In this case, we paid them before we needed to, two full years ahead of time, which ends up saving taxpayers about $82 million in what would have been interest payments on these loans. So I hate interest. Uh, payments. It's it's literally like grabbing taxpayer dollars and just setting them on fire. They can never be used for any other positive purpose. And so anytime I can um, try to take debt off our books uh, when we're able to and eliminate impending um, interest payments, that's certainly the, the, the goal and the vision that my staff and I are both in tune with. So um, great news for Illinois taxpayers. And, and again, you know, had we not been in such horrific uh, economic economic circumstances that we inherited. You know, I walked into the controller's office during the worst fiscal crisis in the state's history, which was the budget impasse. And I walked in to a horrendous financial situation that I have now been charged with cleaning up when people elected me. But our bill backlog was as bad as almost 17 billion, 16.7. 
And by the way, let me put this in context for your audience, right? We're talking about eight consecutive credit downgrades before I became controller under Governor Rauner during the best economic market, the best bull market of our lifetimes, right? Every other state in the nation was socking money away into their rainy day funds and and taking advantage of this incredible economy. Yet in Illinois, under the prior governor, you know, he racked up eight consecutive credit downgrades on his watch. It's really inexcusable. It's unforgivable. And that's what I was charged with trying to clean up. So we wouldn't have had to borrow from the federal government if we had more than 30 seconds worth of uh, money available in our rainy day fund. But that's what he left us with. And so, you know, we did what we needed to do. Um, borrowing from the federal government was clearly the smart thing to do because that was where, where we would get the lowest possible interest rate. And so um, we did what we needed to do under the most difficult circumstances. But clearly, we've done what I don't think anyone has done, which is repaid that loan two years ahead of time. So it was just great news. So that's the good news. That's one bill paid off. We also yep. have to talk about this other big chunk of money that the state owes to the federal government um, through the insurance, uh, Federal Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. That's from a loan yes. that it took out to cover unemployment benefits during the pandemic. Illinois now owes some, I think it's $4.5 billion to the federal government. Mm-hmm. You, were, you were talking about interest you know, being wasteful. That is interest that is accruing fast, some $2 million a week by some estimates. Mm -hmm. Um, Cranes has called it this like ticking fiscal time bomb. I feel like this is one of like the big questions in Springfield right now. I mean, what what do we do about this? How is the state going to pay this off? And specifically, what is your role in that plan? So I am very concerned about it, which is why I've been bringing this to the forefront and talking about it. I've certainly not shied away from talking about the need to repay this this debt as well. I mean, this was an advance that was taken by Illinois uh, during the worst days of the pandemic when people had lost their jobs and they had essentially run out of money. And so uh, the the Illinois, state of Illinois was we had a pretty good uh, amount of money in that unemployment insurance fund, but obviously burned through it very quickly during the pandemic. So once they ran out of money on what we had, we did take an advance along with pretty much, I think it was uh, 28 states total across the country that needed to take an advance from the federal government in order to keep people receiving some income from the unemployment fund. Now, we, we tried to do that to help families. The governor did, right? This was uh, an initiative of the governor's to keep people, um, you know, able to make their rent payments or their mortgage payment or feed their families, et cetera. But it cost money, right? And so the state took on this advance. At the time when they offered these advances to these 28 states, well, they offered them to all of them, but I think it was 28 they took advantage of them. Um, they had waived the interest on these advances. So, you know, we weren't paying interest on any of this money. That interest, though, was set to expire on September 6th of 2021, right? We're in 2022. I lose track here. But yes, so last year, September 6th was the last day that those advances would not be incurring interest payments. They would be waived. But I think when they set that September 6th date, um, it was clearly just a, a completely random you know, date that was probably based on the fact that they would hope that the pandemic would have been over by then. Just and to be states, clear, you're saying that's when the waiver would have expired and the yes. state had to start paying interest again. It's September. Yes, 6th. They, thank you for clarifying that. Yes, they set the September 6th date of when, after September 6th, the states would have to incur interest on that advance. And so the September 6th date was just an arbitrary date, assuming that the pandemic would be over by then. But clearly, we're not out of a pandemic. As a matter of fact, we are currently still in a Omicron spike, right? And so um, the states are still hurting for cash. And and um, so now, though, I'm very concerned because we don't have a 0% interest loan, right? We have um, a loan that's accruing interest at about $2 million bucks a week, and I hate paying interest. So that is why I've been very vocal about the need to get this situation resolved as quickly as possible. There are You know, there are folks who think that the ARPA funds should be utilized to pay for that. And I agree that a large portion of those ARPA funds should go towards paying down this debt as quickly as possible. But realistically speaking, even if they used every penny of the ARPA funds, which is likely not to happen, there's still not enough ARPA funds available to pay for the entirety of what is owed to the Fed. So there's going to have to be some negotiation that gets done between the governor, um, you know, the business community and labor um, to try to get that debt resolved as quickly as possible and stop 
these interest payments. Uh, and my understanding is that those negotiations are taking place as we speak. Do you have a role in those negotiations or helping sort of propose solutions or is your role just to say, hey, here's what the problem is? Let's do yeah, so I don't have a role in the negotiations, but I've been very vocal about the need to get this going, you know, sooner than later. And, and that's a whole point of what I do as controller is I shine a light on what the state's fiscal situation is. And transparency for me clearly breeds accountability. And so when we're not talking about these, when we're not shining a light on these liabilities, people tend to like, you know, forget about them or they don't want to uh, talk about them. They don't necessarily feel the urgency to address the problem. And so I'm perfectly okay with acknowledging that the state has problems because the more you talk about them, the more financially aware you are of your own situation, should that be good or bad. Um, especially when it's bad, that gives you, it reminds you, hey, you can't ignore this debt. We have to do something to pay it off as quickly as possible. But if you pretend it's not there, right, you can kind of go about your other business. So I think uh, this is a debt that needs to be resolved as quickly as possible. I can think of many other ways to spend two million bucks a week than on setting it on fire. And so that's why, um, you know, I'm encouraging and using my uh, my speaking pulpit, right, as controller to shine some light on this and say, come on, everybody who has an actual direct role in fixing this, you get, need to get to work and fix it. You and some financial executives from other states, as I understand it, wrote a letter to federal treasury officials last month, basically asking them to cut the states some slack on this to, was it suspend uh, interest payments on that? Can you Tell me more about that. What happened yes. That? As a matter of fact, last month, it was like right in the middle of the month around December 14th, I think. Um, you know, I had uh, taken the lead on putting together seven other states along with Illinois who still are in the process of figuring out how they're going to pay down these debts. No one's asking for this debt to be forgiven. So I just want to be clear about that, right? We're not asking for any sort of debt forgiveness or bailout. What we're asking for is just to give us a um, continue the waiver, right, on these interest payments until we have enough time to figure out how we're going to cobble the money together to pay down this debt. And we're not asking for that, you know, forever. It's just in the in, while we're still in the middle of this COVID crisis. So, you know, states obviously uh, want to be able to pay these debts back. And, and those seven other states joined me in writing a letter just simply asking for, for that waiver to be reinstated uh, while the states, you know, figure out how they can pay down this debt. Uh, and still try to manage the pandemic, which is clearly not gone even remotely. We're actually still in a spike. And that's not just in Illinois, but in those other seven states that signed on to the letter. So no response yet? No, no response. But, you know, I, you know, people say, well, why would you do that if they're never going to say yes? And I'm like, well, because if you don't ask, you don't get, right? And it is our jobs as constitutional financial officers here to try to protect every taxpayer dollar from the state. And uh, that's what we did, you know, and so I, I wanted to bring this issue again to the forefront at the federal level as well and say, hey, I know you guys picked the September 6th date. We all understand that it was an arbitrary date that the expectation would be when they first passed this, that by then things are going to be much better. But they're clearly not much better. The pandemic is still raging. And I think it was a legitimate request that it would be negligent not to ask for a waiver on, on interest. So we're doing our jobs. Hopefully the federal government will see that this is not an, you know, unruly or, you know, unnecessary ask and that they'll, they'll help us not with giving us more money there, but in just saying, okay, we don't need to be having these states that are already strapped for cash and trying to figure out how to do this, uh, you know, greater problems to add on to what they're already dealing with. You mentioned the importance of shining a light on, you know, negative conditions of Illinois finances. So let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about that. You mentioned the state's rainy day fund. Um, the budget stabilization fund, pension stabilization fund in 2020 when the pandemic first hit, and it would have been very nice for the state to be able to lean on some emergency cash reserves. A lot of us nice. were pretty alarmed to learn that the state's rainy day fund had all of, what, $60,000 in it or enough to keep yeah. the government running for 30 seconds, like you said. Um, the fund looks like it's a bit larger now at $9 mm -hmm. million and change, according to your 19, last report. 19, 19 million. million, excuse yeah. me. Um, but it's still not much in there, right? 
No, of course not. And so, you know, when you think of $60,000 versus 19 million, you can look at that and say, wow, that's a, that's a really big jump, right? Having said that, it's still woefully pathetic, right? And I'm not embarrassed to say that. That's my job. I need to draw attention to the, the need that we have to um, continue deposits regularly into this rainy day fund. And we need to do everything we can. The f- priority number one, of course, was I had to pay down a bill backlog that was just gigantic. It was really horrendous. If you think about almost $17 billion of unpaid bills to vendors across the state of Illinois who did their part, right? They paid, I mean, they delivered their services on time, but the st- state made them wait on average about 210 days to get paid. Really unconscionable, right? And so my priority was let's pay down, let's tackle that bill backlog as quickly as possible. And and I, I guess now's a good time to say, how did we do that, right? Number one, we didn't do it with federal stimulus funds. And that's a key point I need to drive home. Um, what I did do is every chance I've had over the last four and a half years, anytime I can find a bill that will give me a federal match, I take advantage of that, right? And that's going to be prioritized. So Medicaid bills will always give me, at least lately, they've given me 56 cents for each dollar of state money that I put towards a Medicaid bill, turns into a dollar 56. So instead of paying a dollar in debt, you're paying a dollar 56 in debt, right? So you're chipping away every chance you get. When we have a better than expected month in revenues, I target those extra dollars, not for new spending, but to pay down old spending. And again, leveraging federal matches everywhere I get. So we're stretching the value of a dollar. Most importantly, my first two years in office, I had a very public fight with Governor Rauner about the need to issue $6 billion in bonds so that we could get these vendors who hadn't been paid. Some of them hadn't been paid in almost two years. Um, we could get them paid. We could save their businesses. And we could also save Illinois a ton of money because we were paying uh, roughly 12% interest on the majority of that $16.7 billion because it hadn't been paid Um, in over 90 days, right? So that's just unconscionable. And so my point was, let's do the $6 billion bond deal. Even with Illinois' poor credit, we could still get a, you know, probably shave six or eight points off of that debt, that interest, and save billions in the process in interest payments. Kind of like what I did here with paying down that that um, MLF loan two years early, right? So you're saving interest. So what we did was, you know, I had to literally travel across the entire state convincing editorial boards that this was a smart fiscal thing to do. I don't like to borrow, but in this case, it's more like a refi. If you're if you're paying 12% on your home mortgage and you could get a 3.5% rate, you'd be crazy not to take that deal, right? Because you're going to save hundreds of thousands of dollars over the life of your loan. In Illinois, we're talking about billions of dollars that would be saved. So long story short, I won that public battle. We got the bond deal done. And this is uh, even before Governor Pritzker became governor. I was able to take that $6 billion and by utilizing, um, targeting federal matching bills, was able to turn that $6 billion into closer to $9 billion and cut that off of that almost $17 billion bill backlog. So we were looking really good. And then, of course, Oh, Governor Pritzker uh, gets elected, and soon after the pandemic hits. So, you know, Illinois has been through some really, really tough financial challenges. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, our ability to leverage federal dollars wherever we can get a match, um, you know, the discipline that I've exhibited as controller over the last four years, not just in how we target the bills, but also talking about the need to be fiscally disciplined and pay down debts has really been instrumental in getting us to where we are today. But I did want to bring the conversation back to that rainy day fund. Yes. You, know, you were talking about how the controller's office is, is more about stewardship than, than policymaking maybe, but I wanted to talk about a bill that you, as I understand it, are supporting in the General Assembly right now. I think it's HB 4118. That's that right. Would That's propose, right. Um, kind of a, a, a solution potentially to replenish the the rainy day fund, right? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. And and just to circle back with what I was just saying, the reason I went into that long diatribe is because that was the priority, pay down the bill backlog before we can start talking about saving in our emergency fund, right? And just like at home, you've got to pay down your credit cards and you'd love to save in your emergency and you could put a little bit in there, but you really have to tackle your highest interest debts first. So now that we've done that, Uh, is that you're going to hear me talking a lot about the rainy day fund. And we introduced legislation 
even prior to the pandemic hitting, I introduced a bill that Senator Staines was running, but unfortunately the pandemic hit and it that had to take a back seat. Uh, but now that we are clearly, you know, moving in the right direction, I've got our bill backlog well under 30 day payment cycle. Um, we should be and need to be talking, not just talking about the rainy day fund, but actually legislating a solution that would create automatic triggers into the rainy day fund. Because I don't want future administrations to be like, yeah, we'd like to, you know, we should be. I know that we should be. It would be nice to have a bigger rainy day fund, but we don't have to have a rainy day fund that's bigger. So we want to, I want to make sure that we um, enshrine essentially a trigger that when our backlog is below $3 billion, and we're not far from that. I think today we're like at 4.3, um, and we have been at under $3 billion at one point this year. Um but again, when when we're under three billion, that's a guaranteed our bills are being paid under thirty days, and that says let's force ourselves to save. Right? It's kind of like a forced savings. And so, if our bills hit under three billion, our bill backlog, that would trigger an automatic um, deposit of two hundred million dollars into the state's rainy day fund. So, you know, right now you're looking at our rainy day fund went from sixty thousand to nineteen million. But imagine we're running our fiscal. Uh, stuff great and we hit under 3 billion now that 19 million jumps up to 219 million and now we're talking right now we're talking about a real commitment from the state of Illinois to strengthen our reserves so that in the future you know um god forbid we run into another uh economic crisis of no fault of the states we are in a much better position to weather that storm can you call out a goal or sort of a, a benchmark for when you're hoping to hit that point when the backlog gets to uh, three billion? Well, I would say this that I will I would have a first celebration if we're at a three month rainy day fund. I will have a second celebration when we're at our six month. And if we have a nine month, oh my goodness, I'm going to be so happy, right? Because then you're talking about almost a year's worth of reserves, right? So when you talk about your family finances, any financial advisor would tell you that a great goal to have is six month worth of of uh, operational costs, right? And then if you have more than that, well, hey, fantastic, right? Uh, but, you know, my goal would be to see Illinois hit the first one where you feel like, man, we're doing this, is that three-month mark of um, enough reserves. Then a really great position would be six months, and certainly a fantastic position would be nine months. And can you translate that six months would be how many dollars? Well, I'd about? have to do the math, and I haven't done that yet. But uh, but yeah, but I mean, right essentially, now right now we're at an hour. So if you want to like extrapolate that into a number, right. a nineteen million, or let's say twenty million, right? Because we're at nineteen point eight, it's about an hour's worth of operational expenses. So got it. You're talking a few billion bucks, and uh, we're nowhere near that right now. But uh, that's why I want to shine a light on this number because that's where I'd like to see our state at some point in the near future. So turning back to then a little bit of good news, even if it's maybe a little more on the short term side of things, we know that one of the reasons that the state was able to pay off the um, Federal Reserve loan early was because revenues have been higher than expected lately, right? So we saw this yes. in the most recent report from COGFA, from the Commission on Government Forecasting and Accountability, that income tax receipts, sales tax receipts both went way up last year. Can you talk uh, me through that a little bit to sort of put it in context. Is that something that you're banking on continuing and really helping all these plans that you have, or should we see it as sort of a one-time fluke of pandemic recovery? Listen, I always think that we should be looking at these um, enhanced revenues as a one-time thing, because my job is to make sure that I have enough revenue to be able to, or that these revenues are utilized in a way that we could pay the most amount of bills down, right? And so I don't ever want to err on the side of being uh, overly optimistic about projections. And remember, projections are just projections. They could turn south in an instant, right? So next year's projection, the outlook looks good. It looks uh, positive for Illinois. Um, having said that, I still have to be conservative on how I think about uh, prioritizing our bills, right? So um, until the money is in, it doesn't matter what the projection is for me as controller because I can only pay down bills with real money, not projected money. Does that make sense? So, um, but, the, but I would say that the outlooks look positive. And the most important thing here to acknowledge, I would argue, is, is not – it's great that we had these new revenues – but the best thing about these new revenues is that I didn't let them sit in some account so that next year's budget gets to spend them, right? 
I wanted to make sure that if we get new revenues, I'm going to target every single dollar that I can to pay down existing debts. And I think that's the most responsible approach to managing money for taxpayers is let's meet our obligations that we've already incurred. And once we've paid down all of that and we don't have all these, if you want to think about it as a household, if you have five credit cards out there, you should pay those credit cards down before you go on a new spending spree. And if the money's just sitting around, it's just really easy to want to spend it. And so I have, um, you know, it's my job to decide uh, what bills we're going to pay and how we're going to pay them. And um, if I have those revenues available, I'm going to utilize them to pay down our debts. So when you say debts, are you just talking about the bill backlog? Or are you also talking about paying down other bonds or what does well, that entail? Spe- it's kind of a combination because you just saw that we used those revenues to pay down that MLF borrowing early, right? We could have just said, we're not going to worry about that and just pay. Uh, it was a, almost close to $700 million a year over the three-year period of the loan. Um, but I said, hey, if we can save $82 million in interest, let's do that right now. Um, and that was a smart and fiscally, you know, uh, disciplined approach to, to utilizing those revenues. Um, but we still have a $4 billion uh, bill backlog. We still have, um, we still have interfund borrowing that has to be repaid. And um, even though I don't pay interest on the interfund borrowing, um, the markets have acknowledged that the interfund borrowing that is still pending is um, kind of one of the obstacles to giving us an additional credit upgrade. Can you so, just pause and, and define that interfund borrowing? Sure. So interfund borrowing is there's all these you know state funds, right? Like hundreds of state funds. And let's say you're a state agency. I'm just gonna, and this is just all hypothetical, okay? Just to be clear, um, let's say you're a state agency. I'm gonna name one. Um, corrections, right? Uh, And there's like another state agency, let's say human services. Uh, And there's bills in both. But, and they all have their own budget lines, right? The state says corrections is going to get a billion dollars for their, all their expenses that they need. And um, HFS is going to get a billion dollars. I'm just using fake numbers here, right? Um, But if the HFS um, bills are much larger, like I have way more bills that have to be paid, let's say in human services than I do in corrections, but corrections hasn't worked through all their funding yet. They still have like a big balance left of stuff that, you know, they have a billion, but they've only spent 200 million of it, right? Um, But I have like way more in bills that have to be paid in HFS. They're burning through their budget. So uh, what I would do is I would borrow from the unspent funds that they don't need right now at this moment from one fund to be able to meet the critical obligations of the other fund. And then when that other fund needs their money, I would make sure that that money is there for them to use because I'm using it from another fund that has not been using their funds. Does this make sense? So it's you're kind of moving the money around, but nobody needs it at that moment. Like the one fund that needs it, that's where we shift that money to from a different fund. But then when when that other fund that we took the money from needs it, we shift it from another fund that's not using theirs. And that's something that I have to do every day. But this is something that you're talking about kind of limiting as part of a debt repayment strategy overall. Yes. And clearly, none of those state agencies are, are utilizing the money that I'm using. It's a cash flow mechanism. It's a cash flow tool for me. But it does have to be paid back by a certain time, right? And everyone's different. But the point is, um, theoretically, you could say, well, that's it's a good practice because I'm not paying interest on those loans, right? It's just we're borrowing from one fund to another fund. But the credit rating agencies who analyze our creditworthiness, they keep talking about this is an issue for them, right? They want us to pay back that those inner fund. They should all be made whole. And that is one of my goals. And so every time you see that report, so in the past, we used to update the general funds payables backlog. It used to have, I don't know if you have one of my old reports prior to these new I ones. have your current one up right now. It says general funds payables backlog is about $4.3 billion. Yeah. Now, if you go to my website, just for fun, can we play this game? Sure. Uh, go to the IllinoisController.gov. Go to the bottom, scroll mm-hmm. down to the bottom, and then you'll see a backlog voucher report. 
And every day you could check to see where we're at. So although we post this every Wednesday now as, you know, just a point of transparency for people, the bill backlog is always just a snapshot in time. Like today it's 4.3, tomorrow it could be 4, or it could be 5, right? just depends how many bills I get sent to me overnight and how many bills get paid that day, right? So this number is going to fluctuate. The key marker in following our success right now isn't even this number. It's how many days it takes to pay a bill. And as long as that's under 30 days, that's perfect. So, um, but right look at this. 14.5, according to your last report? Yeah, which is like tremendous, right? Anything under 30 days is just like gold standard. It's For better how long than, it takes people to get paid. Yes, th that's better actually than most businesses who have like a net 45 to 60 days. So we're paying faster than we've paid in decades in my office right now. And when you put it in the context that we've done that without using federal stimulus funds and in the middle of a pandemic, it really truly is remarkable. I'm very proud of it. But now go to this uh, estimated general funds payable backlog, the little description. Do you see that? And it says this backlog includes general funds liabilities currently at the Illinois Office of Controller and the estimated 543 million reported by state agencies. Now it says it does not include 0.724 billion in short-term borrowing that is required to be repaid. Now we're going to repay that 0.724 before the end of this fiscal year. So by July 1st, you'll see that that line disappears. And then, um, and that the is short term borrowing. Yes. So that would be like when we borrowed 400 million from the treasurer or we did inner fund borrowing from other agencies. And so my goal is to pay all of that back before June 30th. And then the credit rating agencies will hopefully give us our next credit upgrade. Got it. So shifting gears a little bit here. There is also the fact also reported by COGFA last month that the state's unfunded pension liability actually shrank last fiscal year. Um, yep. Not something we're used to seeing. It shrank from about $144 billion to $130 billion. Still, you know, the worst in the country by far. But same question um, as with the revenues. I mean, how should we understand this? Is this a fluke or is this a sign of things to come? Well, it's a combination of things, but mostly I would attribute this drop in the unfunded pension liabilities to the market performing fantastic, right? I mean, it performed spectacularly uh, over the last year. So um, we had pension funds that were really taking advantage of great market returns. And thank, thanks to that, I would say is the, the vast majority of why we see a dramatic drop in unfunded pension liabilities, because I would say that it's 9.9%. That's almost 10%. That's pretty dramatic. And it also attributed to the, um, the larger funded ratio um, of these pension liabilities. So the five funds combined are funded at about 46.5%, which is woefully underfunded, um, but it's better almost 20% increase from where they were last year. So, you know, this is really good news. Um, and just to put it into context, when people hear like $129 billion in unfunded pension liabilities, of course, like they're like, what does that mean? That just sounds horrific. But it would be horrific and it would be incredibly scary um, if that meant that I had to pay every single, if every single state employee in Illinois decided to retire tomorrow and wanted a lump sum payout, right? Then that means that I would have to come up with 129, almost $130 billion overnight. So that would be catastrophic. But the reality of it is, is that this number is, it is scary and it does need to be addressed, but it doesn't need to be addressed tomorrow. It needs to be addressed over the next 30 to 40 years when people you know, collectively over time retire. This number, all it is, is it's, um, you know, it's, it, it's essentially uh, reflects the, the additional amount that would be needed to pay all of the retirement benefits earned by every employee in the state of Illinois. So it's a number we have to keep our eye on. It's a number that we, I would argue, we should be paying more above and beyond the minimum statutorily required pension payments, um, which we meet dutifully every month. But, um, you know, the more principal you put, the more you put towards principal, the, the lower that number is going to get. And that's what Illinois needs to do long term. Right. So maybe not an emergency tomorrow, but it's still kind of a big albatross for credit rating agencies and, and sort of a question mark for state employees, right? 
For sure. I wouldn't say it's so much of a question mark for state employees because, you know, Illinois always pays its debts. Uh, and the other good news is not only that we had a really great year in the economy, but the pension ramp, if you look at, there's other charts out there that will show you that year after year after year after year in the beginning of this whole pension ramp, which we're still kind of in, uh, Illinois has been uh, putting in less money to the pensions then it's taking out, right? So that is a really bad thing that you're treading water or you're underwater. Uh, but this year, we're kind of treading water. We did really well this year. And next year, for moving forward now for the next 10 to 20 years, um, you're going to start to see Illinois is actually, because of the way the pension ramp was set up, Illinois is now going to be above water or at the very least treading water for a couple years more. And then you're going to start to see a shift in these pension liabilities where Illinois is actually putting more into the pensions uh, than the benefits that are coming out. So, you know, this snapshot, this picture that I'm showing you here, it doesn't tell the whole story of where we're headed with the pensions. But over time, it appears that the ramp is actually working and that we should see our pensions stabilize um, and hopefully get to a much healthier position, even if we did nothing different. But my goal is that we do do things different and we do start to target additional dollars to paying above and beyond what the minimum statutory requirement is. So you are running for re-election now. You are seeking mm -hmm. your second full term as controller. And last week, uh, you got a new opponent, McHenry County Auditor Shannon Teresi, seeking the Republican nomination on what looks like a anti-corruption message uh, centrally. She says Illinois' finances have been, quote, the Madigan machine's personal piggy bank, which has led to waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, how do you run against against that kind of, of messaging and sort of association with the old ways of, of Illinois' finances and politics? Well, I just think that my record speaks for itself. And, you know, I, I think they, they spend so much time, um, you know, just obsessed with ghosts of the past. And I'm obsessed with fixing the state's problems, right? And I think clearly my record shows that there has never been and like will likely never be a better controller when it comes to managing crisis than than I have been for the state. So I'm so proud of my record. And I, I look forward to navigating, you know, the finances again for the state. We're still not through this pandemic. And I think I've managed them beautifully. And most importantly, I'm just excited to talk about, about our successes, our record of success with voters across all 102 counties of this awesome state, you know. So I, I think, like I said, people are very, very uh, interested you know, not on like, you know, the mean things that people say, but on the results that people deliver. And I've clearly delivered above and beyond what anybody in their wildest imagination would have thought was possible. And by the way, during the most difficult of circumstances, a budget impasse that should have never happened, that again, during the best economic times of our lives, you know, the people who served before me completely crippled our state's finances. And I've had to clean all that up. But I've always done it with a smile on my face because I love this state. And I love to see the successes that result from hard work. And no one's ever going to work harder. And I would say no one's ever worked smarter in this office than I have as a controller. So a lot of good news to talk about. And I think that's what people care about, results. And clearly, I deliver. It looks like Teresi is now part of this full slate of Republican candidates, now led by Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin, who announced the other day for governor, um, who are going to be running on what we expect to be basically unlimited financial support from Citadel CEO Ken Griffin. Um, combine that with an election year that looks like it could favor Republicans across the country. Is that something that keeps you up at night, that's a concern for you and, and some of the other you know, state executives? I'll tell you what keeps me up at night is thinking that there could be a vendor out there who was, you know, waiting more than they needed to for their payments. And those sleepless nights are now gone because in my office, due to my work and my incredible staff's work, we have brought our bill backlog down and we have the fastest payment cycle in, um, in decades. And so those sleepless nights, th that's what caused them for me. It was worrying about people who might lose their business because of the mistakes of the prior administration. And I don't have those worries anymore. So no, certainly, you know, having a challenger doesn't keep me up at night. Uh, you know, having to run against, uh, you know, billionaire funded candidates doesn't keep me up at night. I had to do that the first time when I ran against Governor Rauner's appointee. And that was the most expensive race in the country. Can you imagine for a controller's race? This and, is Leslie Munger. Yeah, and, and they spent $11 million in that race. It was just an obscene amount of money. Uh, but I won. 
So, um, you know, I've, I've had to face that before. I'll face it again. But knowing that, you know, if you ever want to vote for somebody who knows how to face challenges and overcome them and deal with crisis and, you know, turn things around, well, that's clearly me. And so when voters chose me twice now, back in 2016 and then in 2018, they certainly voted for somebody who has a great deal of experience, who's a battle-tested and proven executive leader, and who does not shy away from challenges, all the contrary, runs towards them. Because there's nothing that I love more than a big, fat, delicious plate of problems that I get to sink my teeth into and fix. And and that's certainly uh, who I am and who I've always been and who I'm going to continue to be for Illinois. So, um, look, nothing keeps me up at night other than people who are hurting in this state. And thankfully, because of my work and the work of my incredible team, uh, we've been able to um, help a lot of people in this state who for a long time had given up hope on Illinois and people who thought that you should just give up on Illinois. And I've always said to people, never give up on Illinois. I never will. And um, and I know that better days are ahead, but I'm looking forward to being in charge of them. We are also starting to see some candidates come out of the woodwork as potential challengers to Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot in 2023. Um, you ran for mayor, of course, in 2019. I, I got to ask, do you ever think about taking another crack at it? No, I am certainly 100% focused and will only be running for re-election uh, this go around for controller and uh, and serving that, you know, that term. It's like to me it's um there's been no more important crisis in Illinois than the pandemic. And you know, when I ran for mayor, it was at a time when I had already done that huge bond deal. I had the state's bill backlog, you know, moving totally in the right direction. I think I'd paid it down to about 5 billion by then. And nobody first saw the COVID-19 pandemic. So we had a new governor who I knew would not be hell-bent on destroying our state's finances. So I felt like we were in a much better place financially that we would keep that momentum moving forward, right? And so the bigger challenge for the state was making sure that we had a strong leader in the city because the city is, of course, the economic engine, whether people want to see it that way or not, it, it is true. It's the economic engine for the state. So what happened to Chicago, which was in crisis at that time, I thought, you know, they need a good, strong leader. And so that made sense at that time. But, you know, no one would have foreseen. I didn't have a magic crystal ball either to know that we would be hit with the pandemic. And so I'm very thankful to God, believe it or not, that I didn't win that race because I needed to be controller during the pandemic, there would not have been a better candidate with the experience that I had managing crisis through the budget impasse to step into that role. So, you know, I, I had people talk to me and say, how are you so calm and cool during this pandemic when it comes to the finances? And I'd said, well, because I've already been through probably the worst economic crisis that I will ever have to live through, which was that 736 day budget impasse, which was unnecessary. So if I can get through that, this does not scare me. The pandemic scared me in the context of people losing their lives, but it never scared me for a second about being able to manage our finances well through it. And so, you know, I think back and I think, wow, what if I hadn't been controller during this period of time? How bad could things have gotten? But they've only gotten better. And I'm committed to uh, running for re-election, uh, hopefully, of course, winning and being able to continue to navigate our state. What is still through a crisis period, you know? I don't know who's going to end up running for mayor, and it'll be fun to see it as a spectator, but you will not see my name on the ballot running for mayor of Chicago. Is there anything else that we haven't brought up here that you want folks to know about? I do want to talk about what's next in the controller's office, right? We've talked about a lot of the stuff that I've done, right? But I think it's important for taxpayers to know that I'm not even close to being done on what I want to do in this office. I have a really great vision for the controller's office. And I'll hearken back to one of the comments that you made that I don't really have a lot to do with policy, right? I'm busy like managing the finances. But I believe that the controller's office can become and should become a major player in helping craft policy. And how do you do that? By modernizing your technology infrastructure in a way that would leverage really awesome reporting, you know, state-of-the-art reporting, things where you could do predictive analytics, uh, you know, predictive modeling uh, examples, where we can do return on investment models, um, all things that if you can see as a controller's office where every single dollar goes, right, of taxpayer money, you should also be able to tell the story of how those taxpayer dollars are performing for taxpayers. And so right now, there's a lot of things I can tell you, but I can't pump out, you know, return on investment models over time. I can't pump out, um, you know, reports at the, you know, 
just hitting a few buttons and having a report on how is this fund performing relative to other years or other funds. And those are all the things that I'd like to do. Um, and we are well on our way to making happen. So I have a, a project that's going to run about 18 months uh, of a complete overhaul of our of our accounting system, our state um, accounting management system. We call it SAMS for short. And it's been an incredible workhorse for the state of Illinois, but it's, you know, it's a mainframe system. And, and definitely I have the experience having led the city clerk's office in Chicago through its largest and most efficient and effective uh, technological modernization program. Uh, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to bring the controller's office into the modern age when it comes to being able to provide reporting functions and, um, and really craft these reports that would help legislators when they're determining what policies we should be pursuing, right? Right now, a lot of people just give money to groups because, you know, it sounds like they're doing really great work, but we should be able to measure whether there is a return on investment for the money that's being deposited in certain buckets. And that's what I hope the controller's office in the very near future will be able to do. And that by design, will then be helping to influence how policy is created and moved forward in this state. So that's my vision. And I want to make the controller's office the most trusted source of financial government data in the country. And you see this really as a resource principally for legislators as they start to think about how to spend the money, you're saying? Yes. And you know what? I think it's really helpful that I was a state representative for 10 years before becoming Chicago City Clerk. Uh, Chicago City Clerk, I was an executive manager of the second largest office in the city. But as a legislator, I know the legislative process inside and out. And that is a tremendous advantage to have in a controller because you don't work in a silo. You have to be able to understand uh, what those guys are going through uh, when they're thinking about where to allocate dollars. And you have to have a keen understanding of the appropriation process. And I bring all those things to the table as a controller. And I also have introduced legislation as controller that has been fundamentally important in shining a light on transparency, like my debt transparency bill that allows me to see what liabilities have been incurred by the state. Believe it or not, before I was controller, you couldn't see that. I, they, they were operating blind. So when I see a problem that limits me from being able to do my job to the best of my ability, I fix it through legislation. This is why the Rainy Day Fund is another legislative fix that I hope to achieve here. But um, but yeah, you know, being able to um, to tell legislators that when you put a dollar in this area, for example, I'll just give you an easy example. Like for every dollar that you put towards um, substance abuse programs, right? Right. This is an illness. And instead of like throwing someone in jail, which costs us so much money, let's try to get them off of their addiction. So for every dollar that you spend on treating the substance abuse, you're saving $7 in the correctional facility, specifically when you're talking about juveniles, but also with adults. So, you know, if that's just an easy example of like a return on investment model, but you could do that in every single area of the budget. And that's where, you know, if, if legislators are deciding where the money goes, they should be targeting the money where it gives you the best return on investment for taxpayers. And that's what I'm excited about. I'm like, I sound like a big nerd here, but yeah, it is exciting. I think it's a nerdy office to be a nerd. in charge of. It's a super cool office. What are you talking about? But yes, I, I totally get into like nerd speak when I talk numbers and policy, but um, we've done a lot of good. These nerds have done a lot of good. And so I'm proud to be a big controller nerd. Well, we are all about nerd speak at the Daily Line. So thank you so much, Illinois controller Susanna Mendoza, for speaking your nerd speak about the Illinois, Illinois finances for so long and being so generous with your time. Um, and thanks for coming on the Cloudcast. It's been a pleasure. Oh, anytime. Thanks for having me. Always happy to talk numbers. Thanks again to Controller Mendoza for coming on. You can go to her office's website, IllinoisController.gov, and remember that's spelled like Comptroller, to check out her office's weekly reports on the state's bill backlog and cash reserves. HB 4118, that bill that would mandate regular payments into the state's rainy day fund, has been stuck in the House Rules Committee since September. It is not currently scheduled for a hearing. This episode of The Cloudcast was produced and edited by me, Alex Nitkin. We'll be back with another episode in two weeks.